I think four students uh, or two pairs of students have switched, so they know who they are. Um, everything else hasn't shouldn't have changed. Um, no class the rest of this week. We'll start presentations on uh, Monday of next week. Dr. Belmar will be here. My summary from yesterday, I didn't write on the board. We were talking about steels, and I didn't really go through all of this yesterday, but the strengths, or the attributes of steel that make it one in the billion ton per year club are availability. There's plenty of iron ore around. Um, it has, it can have very good strength, um, has very good toughness compared to materials as a whole. It's not very expensive. It has the ability to be hardened. And by that, ceramic stoneware was one of the first materials that we had that we could harden. You could make clay pots and you could form them by playing in the, you know, like, like playing with uh, uh, not silly putty, but Play-Doh, make whatever shapes you wanted, put them in a furnace, and they would become hard. That turns out to be a very important uh, attribute for materials. And with steels, the ability to machine them, form them, shape them when they're soft, and then put them in a furnace, quench them, temper them, and end up with a tool that's five, six times as hard um, that can cut other tools uh, such as the soft steel you started with and other things is a very important attribute and if we couldn't do that we would be extremely limited in all our manufacturing processes. And steel has this interesting ability to be hardened and um, we're not going to go into that in this this module but I cover it in some other modules. Formability. Steel is extremely formable. Not as formable as aluminum but you can draw deep draw cans and things like that. Um, you can make automobile bodies of great formability. And we've done a lot to study formability. And there's a module on deformation processing. And I go into what uh, controls formability of metals and, and whatnot. Uh, joinability. Steel is actually one of the easiest things to weld, particularly fusion weld, um, so far as that goes. Um, repairability. Because you can form it and join it, bang it back into shape, you can repair automobile bodies and hardly know that uh, you had, you'd been in a wreck. And recyclability, steel is recycled. You might have an idea of what percentage of steel is typically recycled today. If we make a billion tons a year, we recycle about 70 to 80% of it now, okay? Um, in fact, for 100 years, we've been putting an average of 50 million tons of steel into the, um, 50 million tons? 500 million tons. Um, in the United States, we've been using typically 100 million tons. And in the United States, uh, this is not the whole world, um, we actually have been recycling. We recycle anywhere from 50 to 100 million tons a year. Um, and in fact, if the price of scrap steel goes up, there's about, um, there's billions of tons of steel in the environment. And all you have to do is, it's like oil. You raise the price of oil and people will go prospect for it. You raise the price of scrap steel and people will start scrapping their old mills and factories and stuff and buying new equipment and other stuff. Um, and there's... You can increase the supply of uh, uh, steel scrap by several hundred million tons almost overnight by just increasing the price, okay? The liabilities of steel, it's got lousy corrosion resistance, okay? I guess if you're a steel maker, that's a good thing because it has a limited lifetime in general. But we spend an awful lot of money um, trying to prevent the corrosion. It's been estimated we spend about $300 billion a year fighting corrosion in this country. And most of that, when 95% of the metal made is, is steel, most of that's fighting the corrosion of steel. It's got um, poor toughness. Many steels have poor toughness at low temperatures. And low temperatures can be even uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. 
in the worst case, even room temperature can have low toughness. But we generally know how to make steel um, and have requirements in many cases that it will maintain a certain minimum lo level of toughness down to like minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for critical applications. Other applications like the inside of the building, the steel that's going into the, the new nano center that's going up now. Uh, you can see the steel framing going up the last couple of days. That stuff probably doesn't have a minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit requirement because it's going to be inside a building that's going to be at 70 degrees. Okay, but if it's out in a bridge in Boston, it could get to minus 20, and if a truck goes over it, you don't want the whole thing to have a brittle fracture. Another problem is hydrogen embrittlement. Whether we're talking um, stress corrosion cracking, whether we're talking welding hydrogen embrittlement, steel is very susceptible to being embrittled by hydrogen, um, and I go through that in my welding metallurgy course, so far as that goes. So those are some of the strengths, but steel does have weak weaknesses. Um, but obviously, for a bill, if it didn't have attributes exceeding the, uh, the detriments, it wouldn't be in the billion ton per year category. Okay. Um, but today I was going to start talking about another structural material, <clears throat> which is sort of the antithesis, at least in terms of toughness, and that's glass. What is the property of glass that makes it so important that we want to use it even though it's brittle as can be? Transparent, okay? You won't find any metal that's transparent. So you wanna know why that is? Go back to your solid state physics. It's cause metals have free electrons, okay? By the very nature of metallic bonding, you have free electrons and free electrons can absorb virtually any wavelength of electromagnetic energy, including light. Whereas glass, there's certain bands in solid state physics called the conduction band and the valence band, and there are forbidden regions in between, quantum mechanical forbidden regions, that electrons cannot have those energies in the solid and because of that, you can come up with materials that are transparent to visible light. Okay, and glass is one of those. Metals will never be one of those, in spite of what Scotty said in uh, the voyage home of Star Trek, where they had transparent aluminum. It wasn't really aluminum, or it wasn't metallic aluminum, I guess, because um, metals don't, are not transparent. But because, um, We'd like to have something transparent to keep the weather out, keep the wind out, to let the light in. Uh, we've had glasses since about 3500 BC. Uh, the first glasses were in Syria, uh, and it was probably, they say, the result of they were making um, uh, um, refining metals and had slags, and the slags in many cases are oxides molten oxides, and they were glassy. And initially, they took these molten slags and they probably made some little shape out of it, and eventually they started making art objects out of glass. They were very, very expensive. And the glass wasn't controlled composition. A lot of it was black. Uh, there's a type of stone that, does anybody know the name of the stone that is glass? Basically, the stone is a form of glass. It's called obsidian. It's usually black, okay? But it's basically a molten oxide, a mixture of molten oxides. Um, and it's not very useful for transmitting light, but it has an amorphous structure. So a glass essentially has no crystalline structure if you want to define it in modern physics terms. But in the olden times, uh, people learned that they could basically melt certain types of sands. Um, you melt a, a sand, most beach sand, is high in silica, and if you have uh, the right composition or you throw some limestone in with it or some sodium oxide, you can lower the temperature and get something that melts around eight, 800 to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's very viscous. It turns out it's a Newtonian liquid, which means you can stretch it just like the silly putty. It gets longer and longer and longer, and it doesn't neck down. Um, in that sense, it has very interesting properties. 
Um, but um, mostly, and the Romans had glass. The Romans apparently would cast glass, melt some glass and cast it onto a flat plate, whether it was a piece of polished stone or whatever, and they would roll it and make um, glass. And so from the fourth century and stuff, people have found Roman glass. Not very transparent, okay? Had lots of impurities in it, um, but they did make glass, and it was for the wealthy people to let some light into the homes, okay, when the sun was out. And it turns out, um, I think I mentioned bullseye glass before. Did I mention bullseye glass before? Does anyone know what bullseye glass is? Yeah, Brandon. Um, I remember it's like what they cut off or hold from forming something else, and it has this like sort of um, sort of cylindrical geometry that focuses light, and it would burn down old. Why the British didn't tax it. Is that why they did I didn't know that was why they didn't tax it. It wasn't taxed. And you can still buy it. Sugar hollow glass. Okay. Uh, except this is a premium product now. It was a premium product before. Actually, good glass. This was considered the rejects, but it basically had the cylindrical structure. And the reason it did is the way they made it is they would start by melting some glass in a furnace. And you have a steel tube here, which they call a blowpipe. And you get some of the glass. You stick the steel tube in the glass melt, and it's very viscous if you have it at the right temperature. And you can get a blob of glass on there. You can then take it out. And glass has lousy thermal conductivity, so it will hold its heat for a while. And you can blow on the inside of the tube with just your, your lungs. And that pressure, if the glass is warm enough, can cause it to bulge and you can make little shapes and if you have hot tools like cast iron or steel you can form it and shape it, tongs and things but if you want to make, let's blow it up a little bit here if you want to make, and I don't know, if you want to make uh, a piece of plate glass, not plate glass, but spun glass you basically make this circular bubble of glass and then you uh, take a steel tool, you make a hole in the bottom, and then you spin it and let centrifugal force turn it into a disc. And right here in the center where it connected to the blowpipe, that's going to be the bullet or the bullseye of the bullseye glass. And if you go to the Sugar Hollow website, if you want to put this over the doorway in an old New England home and you go to some of these little museums and stuff and you look at the nicer homes, you'll see above the doorway they may have several panes of bullseye glass. And that was because it wasn't taxed. It was cheaper because it was sort of the throwaway. It would let light in. It would distort the light. As you said, I didn't know it actually burned down homes, but it doesn't surprise me because it could focus it. Okay, the sun's rays come in there and just burn your home down. Um, if you do it fairly uniformly. This is obviously someone's using beveled glass, and bullseye's glass to make sort of a mosaic uh, window here to let light in. But the sugar hollow glass, the prices are six by six, fifty dollars a piece, seven by seven, sixty-five, um, nine by seven, sixty-four square inches would be eighty dollars each. Because it's labor intensive. Okay? It's gonna take someone a half an hour to you know, take that blob of glass, blow it, spread it out, flatten it out. And you can't do it too fast because glass has lousy thermal conductivity and we're going to find that if you cool it down too quickly, you get all kinds of residual stresses and other things, so far as that goes. So that was up to the 1600s. Um, they were using bullseye glass. And from the larger pieces, you could cut out a piece of glass further away and you could get a non-bullseye piece of glass that was taxed. Um, and here's a window from Jena, which is Jena's in Germany or Austria, I can't remember. But here's a window and up in the corner here you have a nice piece of modern glass that has no distortion. This is the type of glass that would come from bullseye glass in ancient days. So this is a old European home and obviously someone broke the glass up in this corner and replaced it with modern glass. 
um, that's nice and flat. So um, it turns out um, through the early part of the 17th century, the early 1600s, we had bullseye glass in the days of Saugus Ironworks and stuff. In 1688, a company in France called Saint-Gobain, anybody ever heard of Saint-Gobain? About a 40 or 50 billion dollar a year company now. It's one of the largest companies in France, centered in France. In 1688, they would take molten glass and they would pour it on a, uh, a plate and they would polish it for mirrors. And it turns out the mirrors still had a lot of distortion because they would throw the various limestone and potash and silica sand uh, and things into a big pot and they didn't stir it well enough and compositional differences made, uh, made it such that the light would refract, refract differently through different areas of the glass. You know, it might be, might be good for a mirror, which is what people wanted, and they would silver the mirror, so they just wanted something flat, and they would polish it. They didn't have diamond to polish it. They would just take corundum, which is aluminum oxide, and they would polish it. Very labor-intensive. Um, but that's how Saint-Gobain got started. Saint-Gobain, uh, if you ask them about their history, they will tell you that they were the company that made the glass for the Versailles Palace. That was probably 18th century. I didn't look up the Versailles Palace. But, and Saint-Gobain is an interesting company because even today they're proud of their 400-year history. Uh, and it turns out I have a former student uh, who's risen fairly high in Saint-Gobain. I told him since he was from India that he would hit a, a glass ceiling, <laughs> literally, in Saint-Gobain uh, because he wasn't French. And uh, he told me uh, last fall when I was having breakfast with him that um, I was mostly right. Uh, it turns out there's only of the top 100 uh, managers in Saint-Gobain, of which he is one, there's only two Indians, people from India, um, and he thinks the other person is manager of Saint-Gobain in India, so he thinks that doesn't count. So he's probably the only one who's ever, uh, in something like uh, the top 100, something like 92 are French, okay? So Saint-Gobain is a very French company, but one of the things that they're most interested in when they make business decisions, a lot of companies today make business decisions on what the stock price will be in the next quarter. Saint-Gobain makes a business decision, according to Rakesh, on what will make them keep them in business 100 years from now. They will, they're very conservative. They're a French company. French companies are very conservative. In any case, Saint-Gobain likes to look at the long term, and they want to be around 100 years from now. Anybody ever seen the statistics of how many U.S. companies are 100 years old or greater? It's like 5% of the companies in 1900, the major largest uh, 100 companies in the United States in 1900, only five of them survived to 2000. Okay? So we tend to roll through companies fairly quickly. Uh, but Saint-Gobain's been around for 400 years. Anyway, so they poured it on a metal table, spreading it with rollers, and uh, made it. And here's, this is actually how they made plate glass all the way up until um, the 1920s. And here's a metal table. They'd melt a vat of glass, they'd pour it onto the metal table, and then people with rollers would flatten it out, and then they would polish it to flatten it because it'd have all kinds of distortion. The rollers wouldn't be perfect, um, and it'd be different thicknesses. Pittsburgh Plate Glass, which was located in Pittsburgh, there was a building, it was a mile long. And they would cast the, gas, the glass in a little facility like this, pouring on a metal table in the 1800s. And it would just move down these roller beds and be polished for a mile. Because it's so brittle, they didn't want to pick it up. Particularly when it had these surface flaws, it would be very brittle. Once it gets polished at the end, then you could ship it. But literally, the, the, comp, the, the factory was a mile long just because you want to have the process flow go that way. Well, it turns out in the 1950s, somewhere between 1953 and 1957, 
well, actually, let me back up. In 1920s, um, Ford Motor Company, they needed a lot of glass because they were mass-producing automobiles. Um, and they got together, and there was a company that came out of this called Libby Owens Ford, okay? But um, Libby Owens Ford and Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, developed a process where they would melt the glass in a great big vat, might be the size of this room, okay? Takes a while to melt glass because glass has lousy thermal conductivity. And you might heat it up, and to get the, the glass bath uniform in temperature, if you're pouring the raw materials in at that end of the room, you want it to slowly, as it gets to this end of the room, which might take a week, okay, of production, you want it to be fairly uniform in composition because it's so viscous, it's thicker than syrup, okay? It's more like honey uh, at the temperatures you might be working at. They'd pull it out in a continuous stream onto a metal table with rollers, and they made rolled plate glass, just like they did before, but now it was a continuous process. And that was in the 1920s. And then, uh, and people were using that. There was a company in England, which is also one of the largest glass manufacturers in the world, called Pilkington Brothers in the 18, early 1800s. And in between 1953 and 1957, Pilkington Brothers, Sir Alastair Pilkington, developed something called the float glass process. Anybody ever heard of float glass? And what's float glass? That's float glass, right? Well, actually, if that's the original glass that was in this building in 1917, it's the old plate glass that was done in the Pittsburgh plate glass facility where they just polished it. If they replaced the window panes in the 1930s, it would probably be the Ford process where it's a continuous plate glass, but it's still done by rollers and polishing, very intensive. But if it's the float glass process, I can sort of see my thing here, which is since 1960 or so, basically Pilkington Brothers took that mile-long building with all the polishing, and they, they still have this big vat of glass, and they pull it out in a continuous stream, just like Henry Ford did. He rolled it onto a metal plate. They pulled it out onto a bath of molten tin. Tin melts at like 400 or... Was 10, 209 degrees centigrade, something like that. Tin has a very, very low vapor pressure. It doesn't boil until uh, well over 1,500 degrees centigrade, if I remember. But so tin has a very low vapor pressure, doesn't form a terrible oxide um, uh, crust. And if you, and because of the high surface energy of metals, it forms a very, very flat surface. And so they would pull it out, the hot glass, onto this bath of hot molten tin, and the top surface would just be floating in the air. And if they do this as a continuous process and they run it along for about 20 or 30 feet as they're pulling it slowly out of the furnace. And as they're pulling this thing slowly out of the furnace, um, let's see, they might be pulling, I've only been to a couple of float, float glass plants, but they're probably pulling five inches a minute or something like that. It's not, you're not pulling it out very fast, but it's a continuous process, and the whole thing might be 20 feet wide. And you pull it out the right amount and the right thickness, you can control your thickness within limits. You typically, you can make eighth inch to maybe three eighths of an inch glass by this process, but that's most of the glass we use, okay, is in that kind of thickness ranges. You pull it out, and at the other end, you scratch it, break it into pieces, and put it in trucks and ship it, okay? And so this mile-long building became a 150-yard-long building, okay? Um, so this is the float glass process. The top surface that was uh, within the air, although it's not just air, they actually use natural gas, and so it's a reducing, uh, slightly reducing atmosphere. Well, it might be slightly oxidizing, but it's, a, it's not a simple air atmosphere. It's, uh, the whole thing is natural gas fired to keep things clean. Little bits of carbon that get in the glass would be form inclusions. Um, little pieces of nickel sulfide. Now, you shouldn't have a lot of nickel sulfide floating around, but nickel sulfide inclusions are bad for glass, okay, and create defects. 
uh, so far as that goes. So that's the Pilkington process, and that's the way that most glass is made today. And it turns out there may be a dozen major glass manufacturers, but there's only about four really large ones. Uh, there's a couple of Japanese companies, there's Pilkington, and there's Guardian Industries um, that make most of the glass in the world. This is the glass for plate applications, as opposed to container glass like, you know, beer bottles or Coke bottles or things like that. Um, and then there's other specialty glasses. But the large volume glasses are, are uh, uh, plate glass, and I want to talk about those mostly as structural materials. Turns out glass is still a brittle material. It has lousy thermal conductivity compared to diamond, which has got the best thermal conductivity. So we're looking at thermal conductivity versus linear coefficient of expansion. Diamond is out here by itself with fantastic thermal conductivity, um, very strong bonds, uh, which is one of the things. The metals are up in here. Some of the ceramics are back here underneath the metals. The glasses are way down here, uh, so far as that goes. This is some of the engineering ceramics. And your woods and things, your plastics are in here. But in any case, the glasses are in here. Glasses have a fairly low thermal conductivity compared to metals. They're lower than any metals by a substantial amount, which means you have to be careful. You can't um, form glass too quickly and cool it <clears throat> very quickly. Otherwise, it will set up, because of the thermal expansion, it will set up residual stresses. And it doesn't take very much of a residual stress to break glass. Um, I had a case once where uh, some kid was, he was interested in, I don't know what he was interested in. He, his parents gave him a black light, you know, which is just a light bulb made out of a special type of glass. Um, and they gave him a, a black light light bulb, gives off ultraviolet rays. And um, he was uh, playing around with this. And he had just come out of the shower. His, he wanted to see what his body looked like, whether he fluoresced and uh, you know, his soap would fluoresce and stuff. And a drop of water fell down on this hot light bulb, incandescent light bulb. The bulb exploded and took out his eye. And um, they wanted to know, well, why did the glass explode? Well, it turns out when you make a fluorescent light bulb, we don't have very many fluorescent, well, not fluorescent, but uh, any incandescent light bulb uh, anymore. But um, Corning had a process to make very, very uniform um, uh, light bulbs. And then they sold that process to someone else. And they went into the television picture tube. Remember the old great big picture tubes for televisions? And then they got out of that business. They gave that to someone else, sold that to someone else. And now they're in making the screens for your computers and things like that. And we'll get into that. Um, but in any case, it turns out I got the light bulb. And you could see where the soapy water had dripped on, on this uh, black light uh, incandescent bulb. And I looked at it, and the glass was really thin on one side. It was blown glass, just like that stuff in the 1600s where a guy's doing a blowpipe. This was made in Korea for General Electric, okay? And instead of being made on the automated corning process where they made 60-watt light bulbs for people's homes on regular glass uh, with uniform thickness and everything was controlled, they had some, you know, somebody from Korea at less than minimum wage sitting there blowing these uh, specialty glasses. And so it wasn't uniform in thickness. But I got to thinking, well, you know, they may not have tempered this properly. Because ordinarily, if you form the glass like that, how many people have ever watched a glass blower forming things? So he, he takes his little glass tube, and he takes a, he's got a torch there, and he melts it, and he can make these little, you know, giraffes, and, rhinoceros and things like that by dabbing the, the molten glass. Did you ever watch him after he had done that to form the glass with this kind of honey type glass? He would just take his torch and he would just heat it for a while. And what was he doing when he heated it? You know? He's relieving the residual stresses. 
Because if he gave it to you just after he formed it and let it cool down and you flicked it with your finger, it would shatter. Glass is brittle. And if it has severe residual stresses because it has low thermal conductivity, it would just shatter. So you keep it hot for a while and you let the residual stresses relieve themselves while it's cooling down. And that's critical, otherwise you're going to make a brittle glass. And I thought, well, maybe they didn't um, properly anneal the glass after making this little light bulb. And so I wanted to run the test, and the, the attorney didn't want me to know the results if it didn't come out the way I thought it was going to work out. So he hired one of the students to do the test, and we had a high-speed camera. And they videotaped a regular light bulb, and you could drip water on a hot regular light bulb all day long, as long as you didn't electrocute yourself, and it wouldn't shatter, okay? Because it had been properly annealed on the corning line. You go to one of these hand-blown glasses, and apparently, I never, I've still, to this day, I, I never got to see the video, but you take a little dropper, and you put one drop of water on it, kapow, blows up, because of the residual stresses. That's what happened to the kid. That's why he lost his eye. Um, uh, they had not properly annealed it. They had not properly blown it. It wasn't uniform thickness, okay? So you've got to control a lot of things in the manufacture of something like this. But the important thing is if you want to use glass as a structural material, you can't have simple little things. Someone comes along and scratches it, or someone drops some water on a piece of hot glass. I mean, how many times have you heard about... As a kid growing up, you're not supposed to take something direct, a piece of ceramic cookware go, or glass cookware and go directly from the, uh, the, ov the oven into the sink and quench it in water because it will shatter on you, right? And that's because of the residual stresses and the lousy thermal conductivity. So to strengthen glass, we've come up with all kinds of things over the centuries. Uh, Pilkington, around 1900, came up with a way they would roll, they'd pull out two sheets of this plate glass and they're, they're going to roll and they would put a wire mesh in between. They just squeeze it like a peanut butter and jelly or a peanut butter sandwich between two pieces of glass bread and you have the wire mesh in between. And you've seen wire mesh reinforced glass. That's mechanically strengthened. There's also what Corningware did originally with uh, corning wares, they used a glass ceramic that had very low coefficient of thermal expansion. But that was fairly expensive. But then modern corning ware, and corning ware has sold this process to another company. Corning ware likes to get out of the business after a while. They had three different layers of glass. And they'd bring them in and they'd roll them together. And the two outer ones had a different coefficient of expansion than the center one. And when it cooled down, this one would contract more in the middle than the two on the top, and you would end up with a tensile residual stress in the center and a compressive residual stress on the surface. So modern Corningware, you go buy a little Corningware white dish, okay? It's actually made by pulling three layers of glass, the one in the center having a larger coefficient of thermal expansion based on its composition, and then you basically come in with a little forging press and you stamp out the product, whether it's going to be a, a little ramekin bowl or it's going to be a casserole bowl or whatever. And you make it, and it now has resistance, scratch resistance. Well, you, if you scratch it, it's not going to shatter because it's got compressive residual stresses. And you can go through the fracture mechanics, but if the compressive residual stresses exceed the stresses that would be on it, you never get to tensile stresses at your crack tip, and Griffith criteria for brittle fracture isn't satisfied. Uh, if you um, take it and put it in cold water and everything after it's been hot, it won't shatter because you've got compressive residual stresses, even though you've got microscopic flaws on the surface. Okay. Um, when the glass is first formed, um, it has very, very perfect surfaces and it has extremely high strength. When we make fiberglass and it's first formed, if we make the fiberglass and then within minutes, if we coat it with plastic 
and keep the moisture off. It turns out the humidity in the air will slightly attack the glass on the atomic scale and create flaws that will embrittle the glass. Just the Griffith criteria. And I've never done it, but my thesis advisor lived up on the, lives up on the North Shore. He's retired now. But Sylvania had a glass factory where they made light bulbs up on the North Shore. And Bob would stop in the morning. He'd work out a deal with the guy there. He'd get a freshly made light bulb. And he'd bring it in when he's lecturing 3091. And he could take that light bulb and he could throw it across and hit the wall and it would bounce because it was freshly made. If he did that two days later, after it sat in the humid Cambridge atmosphere, if he did that, it would shatter. But as freshly made, it had no flaws on the surface when it had just been formed and had not been corroded by the moisture in the air. It would have tre tremendous strength. So whether you're making fiberglass and you coat it with plastic, those fiberglass fibers could have strengths of 200,000 pounds per square inch. You don't think of glass as having that kind of strength because glass has got little imperfections in the Griffith criteria and the four fracture toughness. But if you can keep those things, the scratches from forming or the corrosion from the moisture in the air from occurring, glass has tremendous strength. So we make fiberglass boats, but we have to coat the fibers immediately after forming them to protect them from the humidity, okay? Small amounts of humidity. Now that doesn't mean that the glass continues to corrode. Maybe it does, but it slows down so much that that glass has been there for 100 years now, uh, some of it, and it's weaker now than it was when it was first put in, but it's not that much weaker, okay? Um, so we can mechanically strengthen glass by making layers of different thermal expansion and getting favorable residual stresses. We can put in fibers, metal fibers, a wire mesh. We can thermally strengthen glass. Um, thermally strengthened glass looks like, I can find it, this. So here is uh, annealed, laminated, and tempered glass. And regular glass. You hit it with a hammer and it shatters, long shards, great weapons, okay? Um, laminated glass, you basically strengthen it mechanically by putting a layer of plastic in between. You glued it together with a layer of plastic. This is a piece of armor glass made by PAS, Protective Armor Systems in Western Massachusetts. And you'll see it's got four layers. It's got two thick layers of glass, and then it's got a thin layer of polycarbonate, plastic, and then it's got another thin layer of glass. And if you shoot a bullet at that, you shoot a 38 or a 45 at that, it'll stop the bullet, okay? If you have four and a half inches of that, maybe a couple of other layers, then you have the window glass that's on the President's limousine, and it will stop a rocket-propelled grenade. What's a rocket-propelled grenade? Anybody know? None of you know? It's a rocket propelled okay. A rocket-propelled grenade, basically, some guys doing, studying explosives at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in the 1880s found that if you had a conical-shaped piece of copper, let's not make it too thick, and you hit, it gets hit with explosives, and the explosives bend that copper and fold it around on itself, you can actually get enough energy that it melts the uh, copper, okay? You can focus that energy and you can have a stream of molten copper shoot out of there. So an RPG, rocket propelled grenade, if you look at it, it's got this bulbous front and then it's got the business end with the fins in the back. And they shoot this thing, and up in here, they actually have a piece of copper that's designed in a conical shape. Here's a conical piece of copper made by 
Textron Systems up in Wilmington, Mass. And it is part of an RPG type system. Um, or in Iraq, improv improvised explosive devices. And what will happen is each one of these little holes right here, or little pockets, they'd put an explosive in. If you put the right amount of explosive and you get it to implode, this thing would, would the explosion here around the rim would cause this thing to explode and implode towards the center and shoot out a beam of molten copper. And if you design it properly with very pure copper and very precise geometry, very precise explosives, you can make a beam of a copper jet three feet long. And that copper jet will go through three feet of steel. I've seen it at the U.S. Army uh, lab in Aberdeen, Maryland. And they, they make these things. It's an RPG. It's the improvised explosive devices they put along the side of the road in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan that were killing a lot of uh, U.S. soldiers. All they needed was they started out with an 8-inch pipe, steel pipe. They had to have a very precisely machined piece of copper. Couldn't be done in Iraq. Had to be done in another country, which I can't tell you. It's classified. I do know the country. And that country didn't really have the technology. They probably got it from the former Soviet Union, okay? The machining tools to make these type of pieces of copper. But all you needed was a steel pipe, weld the bottom on it, put some explosives in it, put this piece of copper on top, seal it a little bit, lay it out there, have a, a, a terrorist laying in the ground along the side of the road with a wire out there. You buried it in the ground. You wait for the American convoy to come along, and you set it off. And even though the Humvee had several inches of steel underneath, just like a rocket-propelled grenade, the jet of copper would go right through it. So the Secretary of the Army came to uh, the Army lab and said, we're losing too many soldiers. You've got to do something. And within one year, no more American soldiers were being killed by RPGs in the Humvees. They went to the MRAP vehicles, and the MRAP vehicles weighed 60 tons. And guess what the armor was for the sides of the MRAP? The sides of the MRAP are these huge personnel carriers. It's like a Jeep, but it weighs 60 tons. It's as heavy as a, Sher as a uh, M60 tank. And they had six layers of two-inch thick glass. Glass was the material, the armor, that would stop the RPGs. Because the way the copper went through the steel is it basically embrittled and melted its way through. The glass, I can't, it also has other reasons which are classified and I can't tell you exactly why. But it turns out, I can tell you, glass is the material. If you go look at an MRAP vehicle, we're now giving them to the local police forces, right? Ferguson police can go down there and and intimidate all the citizens in Ferguson, Missouri. But anyway, with their MRAPs. Um, but in any case, uh, when we came up with these vehicles to protect the troops, they did a study, and they used titanium, they used steel, they used aluminum. They tried six different materials, and the only one that worked, or the one that worked the best, was six layers of two-inch thick glass. On the made a V pattern on the bottom of the, the belly of the... Uh, of the vehicle. Anyway, and there's a lot more to that story, and I'm sure I tell it in some other module in more detail. But um, anyway, so you have regular glass, you have laminated glass. This is what you have on the front windshield of your car, laminated glass. You could have had tempered glass. What's tempered glass? Tempered glass is thermally tempered. You take it out of the furnace in this sheet, and you actually blow air on it to get something like the Corning Ware, where you contract and cool down the outside surface more quickly than the inside. And if you do this heating and cooling at the right rate, you'll get compressive residual stresses on the outside surfaces and tensile residual stresses on the inside surface, and it will have fantastic um, 
scratch resistance strength. It will also have greater strength than the untempered glass, and when it breaks up, it will shatter into little pieces. Anyone ever seen uh, a car window? Side windows are not laminated, but a side window, sometimes it'll have a little scratch in it that's a little deeper. Got a stone hit the, the side window, and a little deeper scratch, and you have cold weather, and you come out and you find you got little pieces of corn, okay, of glass. The whole window shattered, the tempered glass along the side windows. You put laminated glass in the front windshield because if you take a rock in the front, you want it to kind of hold together. You don't want shards of glass hitting the person in the face. Even tempered glass could be unsafe at 60 miles an hour if it breaks suddenly, right, in your face. But along the side windows, where it's less likely, they use tempered glass. Cheaper than laminated glass. But so we have different ways mechanically and thermally to strengthen the glass. We also have a way chemically strengthening the glass. You take the glass, you finish making it, it's just a regular piece of glass, and you then put it, actually it's not just a regular piece of glass, it's a piece of glass with a lot of lithium oxide rather than sodium and potassium oxide. And you put it in a bath, a heated bath, of some potassium and sodium salts. And by ion exchange, the lithium gets replaced by larger sodium and potassium atoms. And you can create a compressive residual stress by having a compositional gradient. You diffuse it in. This takes days in a, in a bath, a hot bath, to get chemical tempering of the glass. But it has fantastic strength. Professor Ullman, who taught me, and who was a glass expert, had a piece of glass that was about 18 inches wide, or 18 inches long, three or four inches wide, and actually was bowed about two inches high. And he could take that with his bare hand, and he could just flatten it. Okay? Just like that. And it wouldn't shatter. It wouldn't break. Even with that type of curvature, when he flattened it, he wasn't exceeding the compressive residual stresses that he got by putting sodium and potassium ions replacing the, the lithium ions. Fairly expensive because that one piece of glass has to sit in this furnace for several days to diffuse in this ion exchange. But in fact, the John Hancock building has chemically tempered, tempered glass. Yes? Sodium and, and potassium. If you look at the periodic table, actually I should have the periodic table right here somewhere. Um, if you look at the periodic table, <clears throat> so uh, looking at the periodic table, lithium, you go down column one, and lithium is small atom, sodium and potassium are larger atom. Rubidium and cesium are a little pricey, sodium and potassium are nice and cheap. Lithium is a little pricey, but you're going to diffuse some of it out. So you make a glass with lithium oxide plus calcium oxide and aluminum oxide and silicon oxide. But 10% of it might be lithium oxide. And then you diffuse out some of the lithium and do an ion exchange with sodium and potassium, which are larger atoms. And so you just increase the compressive residual stress on the surface. Like I say, the John Hancock building, when they first built it, they had tremendous wind problems. The glass was cracking. Big sheets of plate glass were falling to the ground below. A lot of the people on the sidewalk didn't like it. And so it took them three years of the U.S. production of chemically tempered glass to put chemically tempered glass in that was stronger in the John Hancock building. Yes? A little different question. So in the news we hear a lot about like Gorilla Glass for iPhone screens and stuff like that that's yep. very uh, scrap resistant. What's the process that they use to manufacture that? Um, uh, I have to be careful because I signed a confidentiality agreement with Corning once. But um, what they have is I talked about the float glass process. I'll tell you it is the float glass process. But the top surface of the float glass process that's in contact with the air is very flat, very smooth. 
and they've developed a composition that's very resistant to the atmosphere and the humidity and they also probably have a plastic coating on the outside surface just like the fiberglass but without getting into a lot of details they take a float glass process and the out the the surface that's air side as opposed to tin side of the float glass is stronger than the tin side. The tin side has some imperfections. We're talking about imperfections on nanometer, nanometer size, okay? But it affects the strength. And so I will tell you that the thin glass is called, it's called, Corning calls it slim glass. Eagle XG Slim Glass by Corning. And both surfaces of that glass are the air side of a float process. It has no tin side exposed to the, el to the elements. Okay. It also, in these displays, if you look at a liquid crystal display, it's about seven different layers or six or seven different layers. Some of which are plastic, some of which are pneumatic polymer crystals. The first one's a polarizing filter. The second one's a glass substrate uh, with indium tin oxide coated on the surface to make the display. Indium tin oxide is a transparent electron conductor. And then it has a twisted uh, pneumatic liquid, liquid crystal. Number four is another glass substrate with common electrode with indium tin oxide. Number five is a polarizing filter, and six is a reflective black sur back surface, which is probably metal. Anyway, so it's a composite material. The two layers of glass have only air side float properties, and they're protected by another layer on the surface. Does that answer the question? It's a composite, okay? It's complex, it's expensive, and Corning's strategy is Invent the technology, exploit it while your patents are protecting you, sell it off to some, somebody else, and don't, um, uh, don't just stay, keep milking the old product. I mean, Corning understood the innovator's dilemma before Clayton Christensen ever uh, wrote his book, actually before Clayton was ever born, born um, as far as that goes. Anyway, if you know what the innovator's dilemma is. In any case, glass is a very interesting structural material, has a unique property, it's transparent. Uh, we need to exploit that, even though it's extremely brittle, and we, wouldn't, we don't always think of it as a structural material, it is. I could have given you kitchen countertops, I have a slide on that. Um, the best thing is glass ceramic. It costs more than granite, it costs more than marble, but it's got better chemical resistance, it's got higher strength, um, but you pay a premium for it, okay? So we do take brittle materials and we do design with brittle materials, but you have to know what you're doing and you have to look at other ways to strengthen the brittle material or to protect it, okay? So that's it for structural materials. Uh, we'll see you at your presentations. Don't forget to watch the other module or modules and don't forget, at the end of the term, well, she actually send you an email. Please evaluate the course. Protect me from all the other people who don't like my non-traditional teaching style. Yes? And so we can hand in the uh, lecture summaries to both points after the presentation. Yes. I need it. By the time I have to give out grades, the registrar doesn't understand that I accelerate the course. It's beyond his comprehension. Um, so... Um, the last day of class is about the time I have to turn in my grades. And we'll be sending emails to people about we haven't got it. And you're supposed to be able to go on to the Stellar site and submit your summaries of the classes now. I'm told that's on Stellar, okay, of the modules. So that should be taken care of. You can do it the old-fashioned way if you want, but Stellar does make things easier, okay? If there are any questions, let me know.